Amen. Glory to God. <clears throat> the whole burnt offering. And this is actually part of God's plan of redemption. The whole burnt offering. Leviticus 1, 2 says these words. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, if any, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, he shall bring your offerings of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. Cattle, herd, and flock. These three specific categories, cattle, herd, and flock. Now, when, you, when we read about this, when we think about this, since really not a whole lot of us have been part of the farming environment, but we kind of think cattle herd and flock kind of is not the same thing. They're all on the farm, but they're actually three separate entities from the flock, from the cattle, and from the herd. So every time the, when you read something in Hebrew, when it mentions separate items or separate categories, it's for a specific reason. He could have just said all the animals on the farm or, or all the farm animals. That could have been a generic we have put it by specifying the cattle, the herd, and the flock stipulates there's something more than what meets the eye. Transformers? I'm kidding. Um, when you see something that more meets the eye, we're just reading something, especially broken down to categories, it's, <laughs> it's more than it would appears to be. That's how they speak. Is this how God sees you then as cattle? Does he think everybody's just a big old cow? Yeah, but not the way you think. Looking at the perspective of cattle, Psalms 50, uh, chapter 50, verses 9 through 15 says these words, and I will take no bullock out of, the out of, the, out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hill, hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. I, will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Now, when you read that, what does that sound like to you? It's not about the cattle. It's about the fathering. It's about that I got you. Anything that goes wrong, anything that goes wrong, I got you. Whatever's going on, just let, just, just, let, just, look, if you see a thousand mountains, a thousand hills, imagine cattle on a thousand hills. And that's only the beginning of what I want to give you. That's the beginning of what I want to bless you. And if you're hungry, if there's a need, let me know, because I want to take care of you. So when, it, when you see cattle, it is actually speaking about God fathering, the fathering nature of God, willing and wanting and desiring to taking care of you. Just like when you say to kids, you know you don't want to spoil them, but you normally do spoil them. You know why? Because you want the best for them. And you can let them know. Get whatever you want, mijo. Mia, get whatever you want. I got you. You got this. That's what it is like when he, when he talks about the cattle. We look at the perspective of the herd. Have you heard what God thinks about you? Oxen is a perfect example of that. We've talked about this in, in, uh, ad nauseum, but it speaks about the first letter of the alpha, and the alphabet is the A. And that basically the ox means love, representing plowing, as I say, love never quits, no love, love never fails, love always wins, and the greatest of these is love. Now imagine these herds just being a bunch of love coming at you. It's kind of overwhelming. Even this picture is, is this visual picture of a bunch of oxen storming at you. That is the impression of how much love that God has that wants to overtake and overwhelm you. Isn't that amazing? This is a picture intimidating. That's how much God loves you and I. It's like, 
I'm coming at you and nothing's going to stop me. Nothing, nothing, nothing is going to stop me from loving you and pouring all this love on you. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And that love began to permeate. And there's like a rushing, mighty wind. The rushing, mighty wind is a wind of love. Can you dab smack in your face? And there's nothing you can do to stop it. John chapter 14, verse 16 says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Meaning that Jesus actually was a comforter. He comforted them, but he goes, no, oh, there's another comforter that he may abide with you forever. I'm pausing for dramatic effect. I'm going to say it again. Forever. Which means the Holy Spirit is never, ever, 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 ever going to leave you forever. And ad nauseum, forever and ever and ever. And a day. Verse 17, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Meaning, we are all going to be as one. When he talks about another comforter, another in the Greek is the word alos. It's where we get the word ally. Comforter is that the word for helper. Helper. Another comforter could be said another way, a helping ally. Comfortless in the Greek, when he goes, I will not leave you comfortless, that word in the Greek is orphanos, is where we get the word orphan. It's interesting. So he's going to send a comforting ally, and he will not leave us as orphans. Jesus is going to send us a helpful ally who will be like family forever and ever and ever. You are not alone forever and ever. How can we fail? He is never, ever, ever going to leave us. And he's never going to leave you alone. Who is your ally? Your ally are those who stick close to you. In fact, let me put it this way. Your ally is a person when you're not in the room and somebody's talking about you, that is a person who backs you up, is your ally. Uh, did you, Tanya? I felt, love, uh, felt like a, love, uh, a wave of love over the weekend. I was like, whoosh, yeah, it hits you. You'll, you'll soon feel those those gusts like those those gusts of wind or or um or like a wave that hits you like a whew, and it may just be from the side or it may hit you front or the hair in your hand may stand up that is this love the presence of love itself overwhelming you over overtaking you you know it's so interesting scientists have said that when a person is in love they actually have a unique vibration their vibration changes. Did you know that? Your frequency changes when you're in love. Did you know that? So imagine if you were like vibrating, let's say, at a 90, and all of a sudden you go to 150, that is the same frequency as a person who's in love. And the reason why it can be measured at 150 from like 90 to 150 is because it's the same frequency when you eat chocolate. It's interesting. The correlation between chocolate and love. We have Valentine's Day. And what do you get your person that you're in love with? Some chocolate. And why is that when, when people, when they break up with somebody, what's the first thing to eat? Chocolate. You know why? 
because they're trying to regain or reattach themselves to that frequency. People will find out that find out find themselves doing things to reconnect them to their frequency. So a person who's not in love will do things in the natural to build them back up to get to that same frequency of love. Um, this is one reason why people, you know, if there's a, a person who's constantly sleeping with different people, they're trying to they're trying to recapture or be in that position where they can flow at a frequency. That's the same frequency of love because it's a beautiful place to be at. And here's the best part about that. When you are vibrating at that frequency, sickness and disease cannot stay in your body. It actually breaks down the cell structure that wants to cause openings for sickness and disease. This is why the Bible says, I love you and I will never, ever leave you and we are to stay in that place just like we're eating chocolate isn't that amazing Jesus is going to send us a helpful ally who will be like family so it's not about the herd it's about the love it's not about the cattle it's about the fathering it's not about the herd. It's all about the love. And we look at the perspective of the flock. Where the flock do you think he's taking us? Real is saying, like, how, what am I doing here? How did I get here? Psalms 77 verse 20 says, Thou leadest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses, and like, I'm sorry, like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron, but made his own people to go forth like sheep, and guided them in the wilderness like a flock to the chief musician upon Shoshaniah the most uh, psalm of Asfa, Asaph. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, that thou leadest Joseph like a flock, that thou dwellest between the cherubs, cherubim, shine forth. It's not about the flock. It's about the provision. And I don't have to. I don't have to put this. But we know Psalms. Um, uh, oh, great! Now I forgot the Psalms ninety-one, where he leads, leadeth beside still waters. I don't worry about a thing. Your rod and your staff protect me. They keep me safe. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And it's beautiful rendition of where. Every step of the way, there is some oil, there is some protection, there is some grass, there's some food. He, when the Bible says he makes you lie down in great pasture, it's basically saying he's going to put you inside your favorite shopping mall and make you stay there until you can't take it no more. And when you've eaten everything from all the food, co food court, bought all the clothes and play with all the gimmicks and toys and you've done everything, He's going to move you to another uh, another food court, another uh, mall, and he's lock you in the door. He's going to make you stay there to use up all the resources. And then we're done with that one. You think that's it? No, no, no. He's going to put you in another mall and lock you in there to utilize all the resources. You know why? For his namesake. And you've heard me say this before. For his namesake, a shepherd, their reputation is how the sheep look. So if a shepherd sees another shepherd and that flock that the shepherd is supposed to be maintaining, they're all out of shape, they're all dirty, they're all knotted up, they all got diseases and bugs in their ears, and they all got hooves around, it's going to look, it's going to reflect bad upon the shepherd, right? And that shepherd's name will be dragged through the mud. In fact, people won't even want to sell sheep to you because they know you won't take care of them. You won't provide for them, and you certainly won't wash them and, and bathe them. Be lucky if you feed them, and that's even at that. They won't even engage with you and, and, and transact business because if your name is so run through the mud, you've got a bad reputation. Dislike, David said, for your namesake, you make sure that our food is clean, 
Our water is clean. We are not freaked out. Our faces are smooth with oil so our, sun, our faces don't crack. And you put wax and a little bit of oil in our ears so bugs don't get in our ears. By the way, just, just so you know, the reason why the shepherd puts oil in, in the nose and on the ear is because flies can't attach to them. When flies get in the nose and to the ear, uh, they go inside the, the sheep's brain and they make the sheep crazy. So while the shepherd puts oil inside and inside their ears and their noses, bugs they can't sit there and lay their eggs. They they, they, they come out. So it's it's more scientific, but the, the the notion being is that the shepherd takes so good care of his sheep, he will make sure that when he oils their face, he's putting oil in the ears and nose so the sheep don't go crazy for his namesake. So for his namesake, y'all, you must be blessed. You must be taken care of. You must be well-fed. You must have no sickness or disease. You must, for his namesake. If we are all in such a bad place, we make God look bad. So God is saying, what David was saying in Psalms, oh, for your namesake, you're going to take care of us because that's you're not going to let your name be run, 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 uh, dragged through the mud. You're going to come through because for your namesake, you're going to make this happen. So for his namesake, Brothers and my sisters, he will come through for you forever and ever and ever. He is never going to leave you forever and ever. For his namesake, he is going to take care of you forever and ever. It was never about the flock but it's all about the provision. So when you see these three, the single cattle, the herd coming at you, or the flock, all three speak about the fathering, the love, and the provision of our Godhead. Three separate characteristics, one God, one love, one king. So the cattle, he will possess them. That's the father. The herd, he will gather them. That's the Holy Spirit. The flock, he will lead him, lead them. That's the son. So we can see when it speaks about the cattle, the herd and the flock. It's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, about possessing, gathering, and leading. But going back to the scripture, speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, he shall bring your offering of, of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. So basically, you would think, Okay, give me one bull, one sheep, one ram, let's go. Let's knock it out. No, you got to go. You got to look deeper to that. What is the offering? What is the sacrifice that you offer? That you have to offer. So when we look at that cattle. He will possess them, right? From the father's perspective. That means as an offering, you are sacrificing everything that stops him from fathering you. I'm gonna say that part again. You are sacrificing everything that stops him from fathering you. What's an example? Pride selfishness or oh, you're a hustler you've been doing it all, your, all all you know on all on your own all this while you don't need a father you don't need anybody because you've been doing it all yourself those are the things that you sacrifice to the lord to allow him to possess you to father you you're not an orphan any longer and it's okay to lay down your pride yes maybe you can't pay the bills Maybe you can't in your own strength. You can't pay the bills. You 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 can't, you know, be in a place at the same time. Those are things that were, you know, you kind of go, oh, and it drives you crazy. It keeps you up at night because you keep trying to accomplish things in your own hands and in your own intellect and, you know, uh, from whatever you got in your wallet. You try to do everything. But when this is empty and there's nothing in here and your hands are sore and tired, then what do you do? Let your heavenly father Father, you sacrifice those things that stop him from fathering you. 
ask yourself, Lord, Heavenly Father, what is it that I'm doing? What is the resistance that is stopping you from completely fathering me? Is it my trust? Is it the fact that I keep trying to do things because I've always been a hustler? I've always been able to make it on my own? Sacrifice those things that stop you, that hinder him from fathering you. The herd, he will gather them, the Holy Spirit. Sacrifice everything that prevents you from the body of Christ. Whoa, 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 stop. Hold on, brother. No, 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 hold on. Just slow your roll there. You were on a, you're doing good. Now you lost me now. Cause I, I know we've got some, we got some doozies in the body of Christ. Don't get me wrong. I got, I got it. Let me just tell you this. This is what I tell people. I typically run into a lot of people who basically say, no, I'm done with church. I'm done with church. And so I always ask them this question. Hey, you like apples? And it throws them off. And they go, yeah, I like apples. Red apples, green apples? Yeah, yeah, I like apples. Ever had a bad apple? Like, yeah, I had a bad apple. You know, and the apple was rotten or bad. Yeah. Go, Did you stop eating apples? No. You just grabbed a different one from the tree. Sometimes fruit goes bad. You don't stop eating fruit. Imagine we had to take a bite off an apple and it was rotten. Go, ugh, I'm never going to eat an apple again. No, you don't say that. You go, okay, that one was bad. Let me try another one. But when it comes to church, you go, oh, church is bad. That's it. I'm, I'm leaving God. I'm done. I'm done. Funny, you don't have the same, same aspirations when you had a bad apple. And let's face it, we've all had some bad apples. How about a bad date? Ever go on a bad date? Stop you from dating? Good evening, everybody. Heck, no one will stop you from dating. You, you know what you did? You swipe left again. I'll leave that alone. I will leave that alone. Funny, I didn't stop you then, but all of a sudden, you're going to stop going to church because you had a bad time, you had a bad experience at the local church. Find another church. So certain things that stop you from, from preventing from the body of Christ is it your independence? Is it just being prejudiced or bigotry or the unforgiveness? Sacrifice those things. The flock, he will lead them dealing with the son. Sacrifice everything that stops you from following him wholeheartedly. Is it your stubbornness? You're hard-headed or being, you're being sick, stiff-necked, or your greed. Remember what that man said? The man said, Lord, I pay my tithes. I take care of mom and dad. I, I read the Torah. What more must I do? What more? And he said it from a prideful position. And Jesus said, sell everything that you had, then follow me. So Mr. Prival goes, I, 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 you know, and he just slowly, you know, walks away into like Homer Simpson and to the bushes so you don't see him no more because that was a thing that was hindering him or stopping him from following Jesus. You have to understand, like I told, like I said earlier, when the expression follow me, it means that you are sacrificing something. You are giving up something. You're not just sitting there going, well, I want to click on follow, but I don't know if I'm really going to follow you. I'm just going to acknowledge the little follow button and see what happens. No, you just can't see what happens. And I love what the, the Bible says. Uh, there's two examples. One man said, oh, let me go bury my mother, my, my, my mother and father. And Jesus said, no, let the dead bury the dead. Now, when you first read that, it sounds kind of harsh, like, you know, like, like Jesus doesn't care about the guy. No, because here's what the guy was saying. And this, again, a lot of people don't understand this. But when a person in a Jewish family, when a person dies, there's like maybe uh, this, this, the, the, um, the Shiva, which is seven days of mourning, right? And then there's a 30 day of mourning. And then there's the six, six months and then there's a year. So along these phases, there's a family member uh, assisting, like we're taking care of the family to make sure that, you know, bills are paid, 
you know, the farm, the animals are fed and everything's taken care of. So in that time of a person of the say, a, a husband dies uh, and the wife is there by herself, well, then the wife's sisters and the rest of the family members come and they help her doing the Shiva time. And it's that time, the seven day period and the 30 day period, six months and then the year period. It's in that time that somebody is there with that person as they're grieving and learning how to move on. So what this person was saying is, oh, Jesus, I want to follow you, but I need to go back and, you know, kind of be with the family. So uh, basically saying, I'm going to be gone for at least a year. At least a year. So 2024, Jesus, I'm your man. 2024, baby, I'll be back. No, you won't. No, you won't. So Jesus goes, no, 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 let the dead bury the dead. That's the, that's the premise he was saying. The other person, the other time Jesus said, come follow me. And he goes, it's like a man who says, who starts to plow a field. And then he gets off course. And then all of a sudden he, he loses track. And he doesn't, that's, the, that's what it's like when you say you're going to follow me. And they'll follow me. And the reason why that's important is this. When you have your ox plowing in the dirt, what happens is the big old like metal thing in the front that's plowing it. It is so hard to get all the ox and all the harnesses and all the yokes right back in that old, the same, the, the initial trench, because it's, it, in fact, it's almost a near impossibility to go back to where you're supposed to be. But in other words, when you veer off, you just got to keep on going, you know, stay on that wrong path. That's what Jesus was saying, goes, if you go off the wrong path, that's like a person who says, I'm going to follow you, and decides not to, you were on the wrong path. Now it's almost impossible to get back to where you need to go. Or the first one being, you're going to make excuses why you can't follow Jesus because you got to go bury somebody who's already dead and nobody else can take care of him. So you feel like I'm going to be gone for a year, but when I, I'll come back. Jesus is like saying, no, 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 stop that. No, no, no. Hey, fo hey, hey, focus. Follow me. Let the dead bury the dead. Keep your hands on the plow and don't live, don't give up. Don't get distracted because you can get off course. Stay focused. Stay with me. Can you see the importance of it now? And how quickly we will let go of the plow and make every excuse in the world not to follow Jesus or not to be obedient to what he's called us to do. That is the problem. So in these areas, when he's, Leviticus was talking to us about sacrifice and offering, he's saying those things that stop us from him fathering us, those things that stop us from being a part of the body, and those things that stop us from wholeheartedly following after him. In the Old Testament, God asked two questions when we told Adam and Eve. He said, hey, where are you? And the second one is, what have you done? Where are you? And what have you done? Oh, just, just so we're clear, just I've, I've said it before, but I, I want to be thorough. <laughs> when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit and they hid themselves and God was walking in the cool of the day and the Lord says, Adam, where art, art thou? It wasn't to say that God doesn't know where Adam and Eve were at at all times. He is all knowing. He knew exactly where Adam and Eve were. So the Hebraic phrase is like, hey, where are you? Where's your head at? What are you doing? Hey, where, where are you? Are you are you here? You're somewhere else. Come, come back here. Come back here. Where are you? He's right here. Where are you? And he goes, I you know, I hid myself because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? What have you done? And those two questions, where are you? Where's your head at? And what have you done? Those are the two questions that God has asked of us in the Old Testament. If we were to ask you those questions today, where are you? What have you done? What are you going to say? Well, I was on Clubhouse and I was on TikTok and I made some videos and I put them out there and, you know, uh, gave my uh, cash app and made, made some money. Where are you? And what have you done? Well, I went to Facebook and I posted to all of my Christian friends, repent to go to hell. Ha <laughs> ha. That'll teach them, all my Christian friends who already know about Jesus. I'm going to put posts saying repent or, or, or my favorite scripture and then go, ha, that'll teach them. Beloved, they are already saved. You know, I can't, okay, I'm going to give them a little pet peeve on my little soapbox more. I used to hate 
back in the late 80s, there was a t-shirt and it said it had Jesus on a cross. He was a buffed out guy and they had to get a cross on his back. And it said, God's gym. Can you handle it? Or something like that. It was a, it was a cute, it was a cool shirt. And it was like, God's gym, can you handle it? And that's, that's Jesus was benching, uh, benching, benching, like pushing, like uh, bench pressing the cross. And so everybody had on God's gym's t-shirts. But people only wore these t-shirts during Christian events. Now, if you got a t-shirt that says God loves you, God saves, God delivers, God sets free, haha, God's gym, but you only wear them at Christian events, are you really effective? I'm being honest. Are you really effective? No, I want to see you wear that shirt at the beach. I want to see you wear that shirt uh, at the mall. Wear that shirt in the mall. Funny, you've got a problem about doing that, but then when you're on social media or you're in an area where everybody's Christian, and everybody, you can't wait to, thus saith the Lord, uh, and beat your chest with the biggest drum, but then yet you go out, okay. Point being, let the world see who you are. Because he's going to ask you, what have you done? What have you done? If you see, if you keep saying, well, I put posts about Jesus on my wall, but it was all about Christian and friends. <sighs> Could have been more, you know, we're going to need a little more cowbell on this one. We're going to need a little bit more cowbell. And the New Testament, God only asked one question. Do I know you? Do I know you? And the Old Testament is, where are you? What have you done? And the New Testament is, do I know you? Do I know you? And if that question cannot be easily answered, it could very well be there needs to be an offering made on behalf of the cattle, the herd, and the flock. To let him father you, to let him gather you in, and let him provide for you, and let him love on you. There is not a more powerful phrase than to hear Jesus say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. No greater words to hear. I feel like this. I'd be like, phew, <laughs> you made it. <laughs> right? Even that's that's what I'm telling you. I'm going to be sliding into third base around running around home. And then I'm going to see that light go, am I safe? And this is going to go, safe. I'm going to go, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, there's that. Okay? There's that. So every day in heaven, I can just see Jesus kind of going like, you know, sitting on a throne and um, we're all just in, walk, you know, in, just worshiping in the ether and the glory. And the Lord looks at you and go, you barely made it, man. Ha! You barely made it. Anyway, I mean, wow, right? I mean, yeah, you made it. Praise God. But wouldn't it be better to have him say, well done. Uh, enter in thou good and faithful servant. That's what you want to hear. So to get to that place, make sure that your offerings of your cattle, the offerings of your herd, and the offerings of your flock, of God fathering you, God loving you, God gathering you within the body of Christ and the provision of God to where you don't do things your own self, man, they're readily available for you because God is going to honor that sacrifice. He's going to honor it. He's going to love on you and he's going to bless you. I promise you, Things are going to change. Things are going to change. However, those things that stop you to where you are, you are, you feel like you're an orphan, um, or you feel like you're not being well taken care of. That attitude of ingratitude will also be a hindrance, because a person actually, interesting enough, the people who had cattle, who had herds, and who had flocks, well, they were the rich folk. Let's be real. So they had a lot to be grateful for. And the people who have a lot to be grateful for, when the Lord says, I need an offering of something from your cattle, something from your herd, and something from your flock. 
I need something. I need you to give me something. For these guys, it was like we messed with my investment, but it was okay because I knew something greater is coming. Something more precious is coming. Something more valuable is on its way. So I want you to look at your sacrifice or your sacrifice of praise even, um, or even just kind of putting yourself out there more to other than your, your faithful free on your Facebook and your, your, your Instagram and your posts, but to kind of reach out to somebody who maybe isn't online, who is a part of one of your friends and begin to engage with them, begin to fellowship with them. We were at a place this, 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 uh, or last weekend, rather, I guess, on Friday. And I love it, especially to a bunch of people who don't know who I am. And we kind of tell our testimony and then we start, you know, praying over them and, and God starts to, you know, reveal to them uh, certain aspects about their destiny or the future. And then they just kind of sit there in this quiet moment of like, okay, wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, we love that because we understand at that point, something has been triggered. Something has been activated within them to where, you know, like, okay, this man don't even know me. And he says some things that hit home or even like with jury, when he reads a part of a story uh, and just because I, I don't think I shared this with you guys, I, I've known Jerry for quite some time. So I was, I was a little reluctant because the, the, the brother knows me. I mean, he knows me, I, you know, I mean, not, not every detail of my life, but I felt like I wonder what kind of story he's going to give me because he knows so much of me. But he was able to hit on some areas that he didn't know about. And so that kind of let me know, OK, he's hearing from God. And it's when I know that somebody's hearing from God, it really puts into a perspective to where, first, that God is speaking. Secondly, that God hears me. That he hears me. So when he asks those questions, hey, where are you? And what have you done? He kind of already knows, but he wants you to be in a place to where if you know he's going to ask you that question, already have an answer. So when Jesus says, do I know you? He goes, why, yes, we do. We talk all the time. In fact, you can't shut up because you love to talk to me. And I love to listen. That's the kind of intimacy I'm talking about. And that's what's going to happen. Uh, but take away those parameters. For me, as, as a husband, as a father, it was so hard for me to relinquish the clothes, re relinquish the, the keys of being the father. Um, and even though, like, you know, I am obviously a father to my kids and uh, a husband to my wife, but knowing that my heavenly father, who wants to father me, was seeing me be in that position to where I had to go, I, but I have to, I gotta, I must. And all, those, all, the, all that time he's like saying, Let me, give me the keys. Dre, hey, where are you? What have you done? Give me the keys. Give me the keys. And I go, here, take the keys. You drive. Because I promise you, he is not going to drive you to a ditch. And you're going to get to your destination with a full tank of gas, comfort, seat warmers, air conditioning, and good music playing on the radio. That's the God that we serve. He loves you, you and I, so much. And he can't wait to bless you because you've got so much stuff to do. So much stuff to do. But he's going to ask you that question. Do I know you? Just, and just, even though it doesn't have to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. Your friend list and your hearts don't go with you to heaven. I'm just going to say that. Your friends, your likes, your heart emotions, emoticons, and your little like icon thingies, they don't go with you to heaven. What goes to you with heaven are those souls you were able to touch and the lives you were able to speak into. Those will be your likes. Those will be the hearts that you take with you. Things are about to change, all. And you and I are never, ever going to be the same. Where are you? And what have you done? In the New Testament, God asked one question. Do I know you? So I ask you this question. Is there something 
that's stopping you, hindering you, the Lord fathering you from you uh, fellowshipping with the brethren or being out there witnessing or even just being an example of, uh, and, and by me saying witnessing, I'm not saying you have to go to every person, hey, do you know Jesus? Hey, do you know Jesus? Hey, do you know Jesus? I mean, you can do that if you like to do that, but maybe like my Jerome and Josie do, they basically just have coffee and some sandwiches and they go out to the park and they put up a sign, free sandwiches and free coffee. And you know what? People come up to them and they always ask this question, why are you doing this? You know what they say? Because Jesus loves you. Isn't that, isn't that brilliant? Why are you giving out free food? Is it because God loves you? And they always are leading people to the Lord. Isn't that precious? You don't have to force your faith on a person. But if you are living the lifestyle, if you are demonstrating the love of Christ, you won't have to. They will see it and they will come up to you. Do you feel his presence right now? It's so, it's so rich and so pure. Thank you, Lord. Oof. Ooh, God is ready to do something with us. He's ready to do something powerfully within us. Let's just take a moment and just to kind of examine ourselves. If Lord, <laughs> amen, Anita, if we were to ask, if the Lord were to ask us right now, where are you? And would it be done? If you need to repent, if you need to kind of make some things right, make it right. Just kind of be in that place. And just say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. The answer should be, here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am. Send me. I can. You can reach people I can never, ever reach. You can reach people who wouldn't even acknowledge my, my, uh, my, uh, my phone call or my, my door knock. They won't even acknowledge it, but they will for you. I'm not trying to reach everyone. I want to reach as many people as I can, but I know in certain situations, in certain cases, I won't be well received or well accepted. That's fine. I'm okay with that. I won't keep on trying, you know. That's what the Bible says, some water, some plant, others water, but God brings the increase. It's that second one. Do I know you? Do I know you? We can kind of even say that we know of God. It's like LeBron. We all, we're all comfortable calling him LeBron because we, we know LeBron. We know of LeBron. We don't know LeBron. We know of LeBron. So if we were to kind of go, hey, LeBron. He's going to look at you like, do I know you? We're going to say, well, no, but I know you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you know me to just kind of come with me like that? I said, well, no, but you know, you know, you know. I said, no, I don't know. No, I don't know. Then introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Mr. LeBron James. My name is Andre Harden. I'm a big fan. But you are a Laker. I'm a fan of the Lakers, so I have to like you. Uh, and therefore, I introduce myself to you. I like chocolate. I enjoy peanut butter and chocolate. I enjoy uh, science fiction movies and Star Wars movies, and I cry at weddings. What are your hobbies? And that's how you build a relationship. I'm kidding. That you build a relationship that way. You introduce yourself, and you build a relationship. That way, he gets to know you, and you get to know him. And that's how it all begins. That's how it all begins. So let's just take a few moments. I'm just making it right. Is that okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you first loved us. And we love you because you first loved us. 
in that your son Jesus ah, shed his blood before the foundations of the world in the anticipation and the expectation that we would be here at this moment, at this time. But Lord, even as you confronted Adam and Eve and you spoke to them about where they were and what they have done, you already knew it. You wanted to hear their 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 genuineness. You wanted to hear their heart. You wanted to hear where their minds were at. But you never stop loving them. You never cease. You never stopped loving them. Even tonight, Lord, maybe we have said some things or thought some things or done some things, Lord, that we wouldn't be proud of. We ask you to forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for all of our sins, all our iniquities and all of our transgressions and all of our trespasses. And we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And as we forgive them, Lord, we thank you, Father, that you are now forgiving us. And we sacrifice unto you, Lord, those things that stop us or stop you from fathering us. We sacrifice those things to you now so that we, we may receive the full fatherhood or the fathermanship of the kingdom. We sacrifice an offering to you, Lord, of everything that stops us from being part of the body, whether it be our pride or our bigotry or our arrogance or our, our, our unforgiveness, Lord. We just cast that now as an offering to you, Lord, that you may consume it and take it out of the equation so that we may be as one as you and the Father as one. And so that we are no longer orphanos or orphans any longer because we have an ally who will stay with us forever. And lastly, Lord, we sacrifice an offering to you, Lord, that stops us, everything that we have from following you wholeheartedly whether it be our, our arrogance, our pride, our, our excuses, we offer these things that are offered to you. But we wanna follow you wholeheartedly, Lord. We wanna be one with you as you are one with us, with the body of Christ. And Father, we so look forward to having you and seeing you father us. For we know in all these things, O Lord, a thousand hills of cattle, to being lying down in the green pasture and having waves of love hit us every day is what we are looking forward to. And we thank you for that even now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Now get ready to expect handfuls on purpose, y'all. Handfuls on purpose. Mm. Any questions or comments? Amen. Uh, I've written down one of the questions I had. I'm really trying to remember. It's it'll come. It'll come. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll I'll tell a quick testimony. Uh, while that, while you're doing that, so uh, in this uh, uh, little quick little, well, not quick, but this week it'll be quick, but it'll, it's a week long incursion. I'm here. Um, I didn't drive; I flew, and so um, I, you know, didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of stuff. So actually, because my car's in the shop, what, the reason why I flew is because my car's in the shop. So I was thinking about the car payment. And then the mortgage, the insurance, and everything. Then I realized I got to be take, flying for the paying for the airfare and also, you know, the hotel stay. Um, and I'm sitting there going like, "Oh God, I don't know. I'm going to have enough money. I'm not have enough money." And as it turns out, we went to that meeting that 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 spur of the moment meeting in Tulsa, 
and took up an offering for us. And it was just beautiful because I have I have some cash that I was going to use, and I have some money on on my my Venmo card debit debit card. When I went to go get the rental car, they said we can't use this car. We have to have a debit card, natural from my bank. And I said, oh no, because the money I had separate set set aside for the hotel, I had I had to I I kind of separated my my uh, expenses on the different cards. So since I couldn't use my Venmo card to get the rental car, I had to use the, the my Wells Fargo card for the for Enterprise. I thought, oh no, I'm not gonna be short. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. So I didn't know what to do. But as it turns out, the money that was short for the hotel room, the, I didn't even put the money that when I when we spoke on Friday at that event, I had that money, it was cash money, um, in my wallet. And it happened to be the exact amount I needed to cover the what I just spent for the rental car for the hotel room. So God was able to meet the need for the car and for the hotel. And like you guys heard me say a thousand times, wherever he, he meets a need, wherever he leads, he meets a need. Wherever he guides, he provides. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. So the Lord knew I'd be in the situation, therefore provided a means for me to have it on a Friday in my wallet. I forgot all about it because generally, you know, people... You know, as you guys know, through Cash App or, or Venmo, or whatever, or Will Sparkles and Zell. So it was, it was, I forgot I actually had green cash. And so I'm sitting there going, like, oh God, what am I going to do? Uh, 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 wait a minute. Oh my God. And I went, I went to the ATM machine, the positive ATM machine. And literally, when I checked the total, when I, after, you know, because you do it and you get the receipt, it was exactly the amount to cover for Priceline for the hotel. I'm sort of going like, God, you can't, you can't write scripts for a movie this perfect. It is absolutely beautiful to see what God does, y'all. So wherever he leads, he meets a need. Wherever he guides, he provides. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. Again and again. Is that okay we pray for you? Andre, we didn't hear what name you said because it. Oh, Aziza. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Amen. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for my sister Aziza. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. So, Lord, would you give us a word, a scripture, a verse, a vision, a prophecy, Lord? That will be a blessing to my sister. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, that is so beautiful. <clears throat> Aziz, I see like, um, like, at, uh, what is that group called? Cirque, Cirque, Circus Soleil. I think they call that the elegant, uh, uh, aer aer aerobatic people. Uh, they do great things and with wonderful costumes. And I saw you, uh, like being led up, uh, from a rope. You're being led up. And as you were being raised up, you, you know, you were like posing on this rope and you were just kind of like, like they do in Cirque du Soleil, you were just like this elegant, acrobatic person on this rope, and you began to, you like this, as if to say, dance upon, and you weren't pole dancing, but you're dancing upon the rope, and then you began to hop on a swing, and everyone was just amazed at your ability to, to like, to effortlessly swing from one, you know, uh, I don't know what you call those things, um, swing to the next, and as you were kind of like grabbing on the next, you were doing flips, and through all every little trick or, or little stunt that you were doing, it was woo and ah, woo and ah. And it just began to speak about your acceleration and rising up in the spirit. And as you were up there, you were able to effortlessly move about in the spirit realm. So I'm going to tell you, my sister, it, it, it is, I'm getting the impression that your spirit man has gotten stronger. 
because it's in an environment where it's able to be free because what you don't realize and probably something you probably weren't even thinking about because you were having such a great time was that they removed the safety net from underneath you. <laughs> and by removing that safety net, you were in such confidence, you didn't even need it. You were so confident to know that you're gonna hit every mark, that you're gonna catch that next swing, you're gonna catch that next rope, and that you were able to do these tricks and this effortless, this beauty, this, this symphony dance upon the ropes of the heavenlies, it was just mesmerizing. So not only are you accelerating and growing in the things of the spirit, but people watching you are absolutely amazed at, at seeing what God is doing in you and then through you. Trapeze, yes, thank you, Marilyn. This is uh, tra tra trapeze. You were just, just effortlessly just flowing, and you didn't even realize they removed the safety net. Because I believe that you made the decision. If I go down, I go down. That's it. Game over. But while I'm up here, I'm staying up and I'm never coming down again. And it's in this arena and then this 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 beautiful dance along along the winds that God is causing you to fly, causing you to soar. So my sister, let them be amazed. Let them be wild because the best show has yet to be seen. So all your your individual skills, talents, and abilities have yet to be seen, but they were absolutely wonderful, my sister. So you were in the right place. You were in a great place. And those who are looking up to you, and then they were literally looking up to you, are literally amazed at seeing what God is doing in you and through you. And the Father is well pleased with the progress because each and every day, it gets more exciting, it gets more beautiful, it gets more just precious because you're in an element and in a zone where God can fully use you to the best of your ability and gifts. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. This is Tanya. Um before Prophet Harden started speaking, I heard um, the song um, Chandelier. I don't know who sang it, but it's like, I want to swing from the chandelier. And I thought I was going crazy. I'm like, what, God? So when Prophet Harden started speaking about that um, acrobatics, I, I saw you swinging on a, a chandelier. And it was um, a beautiful chandelier. And it's like, you're just swinging on it. And I'm hearing the song play in the background. So maybe that's a song you might want to listen to the lyrics. I'm not sure um, um, if that's a song that, you know, God wants you to listen to and just kind of soak in that. But yeah, that's that's what I saw. So God bless you. Man, that's precious. That's awesome. Thank you. I love it. Anybody else? I could always do for a prayer, Pastor Harden. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Wow, that was quick. Lynn, even before you even, I think what happened was um, when I, I think I think I had finished praying for Aziza, and then I saw your because on my little screen, your name had the little blue thing, like you know, like you had, I don't know if you said something, or whatever, but your, your name lit up, and as your name lit up, the Lord was showing me that the Lord, the Lord, the, the Lord was showing me that the Lord has taken your car out of neutral and engaging into gear. So you've been in like this, you know, I don't know if you've ever drove, if you've ever drove in a stick before, but when the car is in neutral, I mean, you could push down on the gas. And you could put all the lights on and you can hear the engine going, but you were going nowhere. And all of a sudden I saw the Lord shift you in the gear. And I was like, Bing! and like just, just quick, just suddenly just pop off. So my sister expect a sudden pop off, a sudden uh, uh, acceleration. And it, it may take you by surprise because you seem to be kind of startled when it took place because you weren't expecting it. But I'm here to tell you, you were about to engage the gears 
Now, whatever has been on standby, whatever has been in neutral is about to be put into drive. And it's going to be a quick burst of energy, a quick thrust forward. And it's going to be absolutely, I mean, the timing of this could not be perfect because God is about to make a way where it seemed to be no way. In Jesus' name. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm receiving all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Whew. Here comes another wave of love, y'all. Just get ready to receive it. Release. Ah. Uh. It's like ocean waves. This kind of and another one comes. I believe we open up the floodgates of having the waves of love just kind of pour over us. Uh, you may not be a feeler, you may smell something, or you may sense something, you may hear something, or you may even see flashes of light. Whatever it is, whatever your sensory is, just know there, it's going to be coming in waves at you. So don't freak out. It's just God's way of saying that he loves you and he has received your sacrifice. <laughs> oh, my God. God is good, y'all. God is so good. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hmm. Hey, JJ Hendry. As you were praying, there was like this huge storm outside that came out and it was like thunder and lightning and hailing outside. And I mean, I could see lightning. And as I was just, you know, as I was um, shutting my eyes and just listening and paying attention to what you were saying, it just came in stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And um, there's just, I, um, if you don't mind, I would like prayer also. For the storm or? Oh, no, for um, whatever is. Um, yeah, I just I, I just want confirmation or. Um, I don't know how to explain it. Never mind. <laughs> so, OK, let, let me see if I can do this. So there's a situation. That you need confirmation on, but you don't want me to, you don't want to say what it is, because you want it to be you want you want it to be holy from God. Without an influence. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First and foremost, wherever he leads, he meets the need. Wherever he guides, he provides. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. Now, in a situation that you are not asking about, but need confirmation on, I'm going to tell you, well, as soon as the need is met, as soon as the bill is paid, and as soon as the, 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 uh, the guidance is in place, you're going to find out that the provision, the finances, and the resources are going to be there for you. But it is in that exactly where you are at this point in time. I sense that you are now, as you are, you know, waiting for the green light, you're in the right position for the light to turn green. If you veer off from this, it's going to take a little bit longer to get you right back on track. But as you are right now, in other words, you're at the crosswalk, you're at, at the intersection of the, uh, the crosswalk. If you weren't there, that light will never turn green. But as soon as you get in that right place, I'm going to tell you, my sister, the light will be green. So the Lord is kind of waiting on you, but you're waiting on him, but he's waiting on you. But as soon as you get in the right place, then you're there. You're right there at the right place, which means the light's going to turn green any moment. And when the light turns green, you'll be able to walk through. And as you walk through, you walk through with the safety, with the protection, and with the confidence know that you will get to the other side. 
and the light will stay green as long as it needs to stay green. And as you begin to step across into that place, you're going to find out that you got to been with you the entire time because he said he'll never leave us nor forsake you. But as you begin to cross the street, don't fear or don't freak out at the noise of the other cars in the coming traffic. Because whatever you do, as you keep your focus on crossing the street, I'm going to tell you by the time you, by the time you get to the other side, everything, everything, everything you want to have accomplished will be accomplished. This is part of the destiny and destination of your destiny. The destination isn't the end of all things. It's the beginning of the process of your destiny. And you're right there, my sister. You are right there. So I want you to be encouraged. The light's about to turn green. And as I go, it's all a go, all green. By the way, blue sky and green lights. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Uh, Brownlee? I finally remembered my question. And okay. <laughs> it may seem silly, but believe it or not, I did get into somewhat of a heated kind of debate, combative, you know, conversation with another believer about this. Right? And it's about God being all-knowing. Right? And I'll start with saying I absolutely believe, yes, he is all-knowing. However, I, I added in a perhaps to the all-knowingness, and this is where I got into trouble, right? And the perhaps that I entered in is, you know, scripture, there is scripture that says it did not enter into the mind of God, X, Y, and Z. You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I started to ponder is, you know, there is a path that's not aligned with what's written in his book, and there is a path that is. And I believe God knows the details of each path. And because he knows all of the details of each path, he's all knowing. However, I believe he doesn't specifically know which path we're going to go at when, whatever given time. Because he's, he's allowing the freedom for us to choose. And because we're, we're free to choose, I don't, like I'm I'm getting into <laughs> I'm getting into <laughs> unclear water already. But you no, know, I understand. Does that make sense? Does that make yeah, sense? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, so when you hear the um omniscience about knowing all, this is like you said, he knows everything everything about everything. So for example, if I were to tell you, if you touch the stove, you're going to get burned. I'm not prophesying to you. And I'm not even telling you the future. I'm telling you this is what's going to happen because I know what's going to happen if you decide to touch the stove. So it's like saying, I know that that stove is going to be hot. And I know if you touch it, you're going to burn yourself. That's not rocket science in this essence. But if you go, I wasn't planning on touching the stove. I wasn't planning on it. And all of a sudden, because it, you, you know, I, I, you were planning on it, now because I said it, now you want to touch the stove to see if I'm right. So when you touch the stove, you go, oh, wow, he was right. He knows all. No, and not that he, I know all, it's just because I know the consequence. We would tell our kids, don't eat that, you're going to get sick. We're not prophesying you're going to get sick. We're not even telling the future. We just know the consequences because the Bible says, you, because, or the key is this, or the rub is this, we have free will. And the Lord, that's what it says, come, let us reason together. He's saying, I hope you make the right decision. I really do. I really hope you do. But just in case, I know some of you are going to betray me. So Jesus shed his blood before the foundations of the world. He already put the, 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 the escape clause into the scenario, knowing that we would blow it. So yes, and I think Jesus told uh, the, the disciples, you know, uh, uh, Peter, dude, you're going to be before the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. Okay, but fine. Once you get restored, go back and uh, and uh, restore your brothers. So he knew that, he knew that, and yet still allowed that to go on, allowed it to take place. So there are things that Jesus knows what's going to happen, but yet then still allows them to take place because he's already put um, the safety net at the end of the story, like basically saying, like you know what, like he told Paul, he told um, uh, uh, Gamiel when when he said. Um, go pray for Paul. And he goes, then, then the, the Gamiel was like, uh, Jesus, just so we're clear, the same guy who was killing us a week ago, that same Paul, 
you know the man's crazy, right? I mean, you know that. And then God, Jesus is like, look, 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 I know, but he's going to suffer much for the sake of the cost of, for the for the gospel. So, but he, you know, he's got a great assignment. So Jesus knew the assignment that he gave Paul, but he knew that he would be going through a lot of suffering. So in that, he does know the plan or the scroll, the life scroll that's written about our lives because we agree to it. You and I have that freedom to say, forget it. I'm out. I'm done. I'm done. Ah, I don't do this no more. And you know what? Because we have free will, he is not going to stop us. I mean, like, I'm, well, let me put it this way. He'll send somebody to stop you. And that person, let's say, for example, and I'm just giving it as an example. If I say I want to, you know, drink some poison at four o'clock, well, I promise you at 315, he's going to speak somebody, speak to somebody. Hey, I need you to go down to this place right now. You need to be there in 45 minutes. He'll put somebody in motion. Even though he's not going to stop you, someone will knock on your door and say, hey, hey, don't do this. I got a better way. Jesus wants him to tell you. And da, 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 da. So there are ways that even though he knows, he really uh, won't violate our free will. But at least we will send somebody to stop us from making some dumb mistakes. He'll he'll at least cause the um, the uh, what's the word uh, the part two, if you will. If Andre is going to be willing to drink some poison, well, I want somebody who's going to be working at the hospital at that time. When Andre gets there, when the ambulance picks him up, I want this person who's qualified to pump his stomach to get the poison out of the system to take care of him. So he already puts in safe, not safeguards, I'm sorry, safeguards in place because he knows we're going to make mistakes because even though he lets us make mistakes because we have free will, he actually already puts the safeguards in place because he knows we're going to, you know, we're going to mess up. We're going to, we're going to do something stupid. That's one reason why they would put like uh, bumper pads on, on baby cribs. He knows the baby's going to crawl out the crib. So you put the bumper crabs, bumper pads in there because you know they're going to get hurt. So you put that in place. Not to say you're prophesying anything, but because of the fact that babies have a free will and they're not, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to do what they want to do. So this is like their safety net. So in regards to what God knows, he does know the end from the beginning, but our everyday lives is how we live, where he will actually himself have to intervene to stop us from making dumb mistakes or to let it go on and create the safety guard the safety nets, uh, the protocols to have in place when we do make these mistakes. So all in all, um, does he know we're going to blow it? Yeah. Does he hope we don't? Yeah. That's when the Bible says the last days, the dead and the grave will give up all their dead. And then there's that's called the second death. We will all be judged by our actions. Some would say, well, God knows it all. He knows he's going to make it. He's not going to make it. No, he doesn't. He hopes we all make it. He put the safeguards in place, but then there are those who still say, forget you, God, flip off God, bless me, the Holy Spirit, and there's no forgiveness in that. And therefore, you pretty much, you've, you've worked too hard to, to fail. And by you working so hard, you're gonna, you, God's going to give you, grant you your wish. He's going to grant you your wish because since you wanted you so badly, wanted to defy heaven and, and curse and blaspheme, fine. He's going to allow you to, even though there'll be people putting in your life to say, come on, man, there's a different way. No, 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 no. Forget, forget God. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. Fine. Then you made your own choice. Now, did he know Judas was going to uh, uh, betray him? Yeah. Did he allow it? Yeah. So, yeah, even though he does know these things, certain things have to play out. Certain things have to play out. I kind of wish we were all, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I kind of wish somebody said that um, uh, I wish I was a parrot and I could just recite the word of the Lord, uh, the, the word of God, and just quote it all day long like a, like a parrot. And then, then somebody said, well, a parrot doesn't understand salvation. So even though a parrot can quote scripture, it doesn't understand what the salvation message means. You and I knows what their salvation message means. And so God doesn't want us to be robots. When you're, if, I don't know if you have a pet, those of you who have pets or, or even a small child, if your child does something you didn't ask, like imagine if your child took out the trash and you didn't ask them to, they just did it anyway because they know that would make you happy. Don't you just go, oh, oh, oh come here, my little baby. And we want to just love on that child because we they did something that we know would make us happy without us telling them to. 
it just blesses them. They're just like, oh, come here. I just want to love on you. I mean, my dog was able to walk outside, go pee by himself, and then walk back in the house when he's done. <laughs> Bravo, little buddy. Bravo. I mean, I give that god dog treats and just love on him all day long. That's what God wants to do because we did something without him saying anything. That's when we do those things is when we surprise heaven. And God loves it when we surprise him. David was not supposed to dance without his, or his, his kingly attire on. But when he danced, the Bible says when he was dancing before, and then uh, Michael goes, you you seem to be, you know, uncovered yourself before the other damsels. And David said, I'm going to be yet more violent on the morrow, woman, because God, that was unexpected of him. He did the abnormal off the cuff beyond the, the, the norms. And God loves it when you take that extra step. That's unplanned. That's unscripted. That's a spontaneous reaction. So just, just tomorrow, when we least expect it, just go, I love you, Lord. Out of nowhere. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. Amen and amen. Thank you for that. Because, you know, there's believers who, who really believe that God expected Adam and Eve to eat the fruit and eventually be casted out. And I argue, no, he didn't expect it. Um, they could have still been there to this day, you know, yep. had they obeyed. Yep. Absolutely. You know, they, yep. <laughs> it, life would have been completely different. Offspring and creation, nature, all that. And they say, no, that's wrong. God knew they were supposed to do it. And there's this conflation of whether something goes right or wrong, it's all part of the plan. Sure. And no. it's like, a degree sometimes that's the case but there is there is um yeah I, I believe that there definitely is you know moments when there it is it conflated into the, the sovereignty so to speak you know yeah. that we're free to choose you know and we got to deal with the consequences of the choice not that it's all part of the plan, but it's it's part of the design. Exactly. Exactly. So just like I said, if I said, don't touch the stove, and you touch the stove, I'm not punishing you. I told you what, what, the, what, what the consequences would be if you were to touch it, but that's not me punishing you. You touching the stove, you are then you know experiencing the consequences of your actions. Consequence with the events that follow. That's what consequence consequence means with events that follow. So you touching the stove, you are you you have to now accept the events that follow, which means you burning your elf like ah, God punished me. No, God didn't punish you. That's just the consequences of your actions. And then the Lord will even say, you know what, you're gonna go through some stuff. I mean, you're gonna. I mean, when He told the people um, that famous scripture, we all love to say. Um, God knows that the, our thoughts towards us, thoughts to give us peace, hope, and an expected end. But people don't understand that what comes before that in context is you're going to be taken into slaves, you're going to leave your home, <laughs> and you're going to be slaves for quite a long while. But while you're there, build new houses, have babies, eat food, get along, make it work. Because I know those thoughts I have towards you. Thoughts of peace to give you hope and expect it in. And then I'm going to set you free. See, all that entails, he knew what was going to happen, but he said, while you're there, don't freak out. Don't, don't go, yeah. you know, make it work is what he told them because he knows the plans and thoughts that he has towards us. It's up to us. The Bible says, I mean, he just got so frustrated with, with Israel time and time again. And generally, it wasn't the plan, even across the Red Sea. Should not have taken that long. But because of the fact that the people who were so willing to uh, stay Egypt, instead of, pro, like, you know, instead of being pro-Israel, <laughs> they're pro-Egypt, it was hard for God to do what he needed to do. So he allowed the whole generation to, to die out to then move on to what he wanted to do. That wasn't the original plan. I'm going to kill some people to get my will done. No, it wasn't for God. He would have loved it that all should perish and not that all should none should perish and all would receive salvation. That is his prayer. Or else Jesus wouldn't have been prayed that. We have a free will 
and we have free choice. Sucks to a certain degree, but in essence, it truly makes when we say God loves us, we love him because he first loved us. It puts a whole new perspective because it really lets, let, lets it be known that we are not puppets. We are not parrots. We have a uniqueness. And when we begin to worship, and like I told you on Saturday or Wednesday, rather, praise is a command. Worship is on purpose. <laughs> By you just saying, God, I love you, that was unexpected. You did that on purpose. He commands us, praise ye the Lord. Praise ye song. David says, praise them, you, you uh, sun, moon, and, and stars. Praise them in the high temple. Praise them in the dance. And you were commanded to praise. But the worship is done on purpose because you want to. You want to. Because when you praise, he comes down with the armies. When you worship, you go up, you sit at his feet. That's done on purpose. Amen. So quick question, guys. Who's going to be the first to answer, do I know you? Because that's going to lead into the next question. Who's going to be the first millionaire? Pamela. Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> All of us. <laughs> <laughs> amen and amen. Oh, okay. Actually, um, so this Saturday, I'm going to be in Carson. Oh, Aziza, we're going to be at Wilma's house again on Saturday. Uh, if you can make it, we'd love to see you. Um, and I don't know if the timing will be the same time uh, for WebEx, so it might be canceled on Saturday. I know some of y'all will be happy about that. Uh, so. <laughs> We'll see. I, I kind of don't know. I'm, I'm jacked up on my time frames because I'm, I'm forgetting that it's going to be 12 o'clock, not 2 o'clock. And I got I have to kind of make my mind go back to Pacific time instead of central time. So I'll, I'll get that. But I'm gonna just going to assume it's going to be close to the same time frame. So we're going to probably cancel Saturday, but then we will see you again on Wednesday. But if not, I will, I'll let it be known. And I'll put it in there or maybe even at Wilma's house. Uh, we can kind of do a live thing and, uh, you know, go live from her house. Well, we'll see if we can make that work too. Either way, if I don't see you Saturday, guys, we will see you on Wednesday, next Wednesday. So I love you guys. Thank you guys um, for your love and support. And by the way, just I'm just going to put out there, um, just pray about it. There's a few people in the same situations who could use um, a little blessing. And... I, you know, I'm not going to say any names or anything like that, but if you just kind of pray about it, if you feel led, kind of let us know and then kind of like say, this is for so-and-so. Um, you know, if you want, you want it to be known, we'll, we'll, we'll send it off to that, to that person. And, you know, uh, 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 what's that word? Anonymously, 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 <laughs> anonymously, 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 <laughs> um, that way we can be a blessing to these people. So, and I'm talking about people in the group here. So that being said, we love you guys and we'll see you either Saturday, definitely next Wednesday. Amen. Love Good you night, everybody. Hello. Love you too. Good night, everyone. Good night, God God bless everyone. everyone. Hello. Good night. Bye, everybody. Good night, bless. Love you. Good night, Pam. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. I love you guys. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good Good no, night, no. sweet. No. Good night. Bye, everybody.